And thanks for staying with us. So I'm very excited about the next talk. We have Robert Sabo here, who is from LearnShip. Um, and he's going to talk about time, investment, and return, the holy trinity of L&D. So he may or may, may not map that to other holy trinities. And we will see. Only way to know is to stick around. So let's welcome Robert. Hi, thank you very much, David. Um, just a quick volume check. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, first thing I want to say is that Aisha Davis can't be here today, and she sends her apologies. Um, but I will stand in, and hopefully I do an okay job. So yeah, um, the Holy Trinity of L&D. So let's plunge in straight away, I think. At LearnShip, we have a history of working purely B2B, so business to business. Um, and what we've experienced... Uh, specifically over the last couple of years, uh, during and then post-pandemic, is that the size of the deals are getting bigger and bigger. And because the size of the deals are getting bigger and bigger, we have more procurement people involved in the purchase decision. And I've picked up personally a kind of frustration on the part of the learning and development professionals that numbers are dictating decisions and the qualitative aspect of learning and teaching may be lost. There's a couple of reasons this happens, right? Um, I believe, again, personally, that it's because as the tenders and the investments get larger and larger, they become more strategic, and it brings in people who are used to making decisions in a different way. But people, coaches, trainers, teachers, see the world a bit differently. And if we're going to look after the art and the craft of teaching, and the impact of learning is actually important to us. We have to be able to talk to business people about what we know about how people learn, right? And the language they speak is numbers, right? So how do you talk the language of the C-suite? A couple truisms or aphorisms or statements I'd like to make. The first one, very basic, businesses exist to create value, right? The job of those management teams is to ensure that their business is creating value. They need to believe that your contribution and your proposals to them are going to create value. If they don't do that, they're not doing their job. It's important to understand their motivations. Decision making at the very top level becomes a numbers game, right? You've got divisions asking for budgets. Those budgets get consolidated. They go through all kinds of review. Yeah, and you want your ideas to survive that process? You need to phrase this correctly, be able to defend it correctly, and in this process, defend something that's very valuable and very fragile, which is learning, effective learning and teaching. And if you can't calculate the value, procurement will do it, and you probably won't like it. <laughs> so this is something, I think it's a skill for all of us who care about this uh, area, right? And more seriously, it's a, it's a way to business success and professional success for many people working in different aspects of corporate learning and development, either on the provider side or on the L&D side. So you need to talk the language of the C-suite. In businesses, people are driven by these OKRs or these KPIs. And one of the things about the corporate beast is that it's complicated. Uh, there are politics in business, it's human, and people are motivated by different objectives across an organization. So if we look at a couple common KPIs from the learning and development department, they're on the screen, I'm not going to read them out. Typically, people try and prove value of their projects and secure their budgets based on KPIs like these. The C-suites on the other side, um, they have their own KPIs. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, right? But you, you get a meeting with the top guys. You've got 20 minutes. They come in a little bit late. They leave a little early. While they're there, they're checking messages. You don't have their full attention. Why? Because they're thinking about their own KPIs, and they have stuff burning in the back. And they don't necessarily believe that what you're saying is going to lead them to their objectives. It happens a lot, right? It causes frustration over a long career in learning and development. They try and find some common ground. That's the first thing I would say. So it's based on a little reconnaissance. It's based on a little bit of knowledge of the uh, counterpart, right? But just think about 
where to pitch arguments. Employee proficiency, retention rates, quality of hire, culture, reduced skills gap, cost savings, and competitive disruption. In the pandemic, things changed, right? You had the big resignation, the great resignation. Now you've got a lot of companies laying people off. Then they're going to wake up and want to hire a lot of people. Yeah? And the people are affected by all of this, and they're hurt by it. And if you want to look after your people, develop your people, make your company successful, investment makes a lot of sense. But they won't understand it in emotional language. They won't understand it in the language that teachers typically use. So training organizations have to couch it in these sorts of terms. The greatest asset of companies is people. It sounds trite or a cliche. I think it's true, though. And one of the greatest limits to their potential is this tangibility bias, um, the value of training, right? And there's all sorts of ways people try and prove the return on investment of training, the attendance rates, the happy sheets, the Kirkpatrick model, the surveys being sent out, you check how they're doing on tests, there's all sorts of things that you do. But at the end of the day, you need numbers that convince the procurement people, the CFO, the CEO on the strategic value of the training effort. And HR faces a number of uh, specific uh, challenges. I've tried to list them in sort of a more granular kind of format here. So I'm, I'm talking now from the perspective of language training. That's what my company does. That's my background. Um, but very often kind of language training uh, courses are quite vague. It's not quite sure which language should be learned. And if a high proficiency level in a language will equate to business success. I've seen that quite often when you've got outsourced customer support, for example. And people do an AI-based test because they do it at high volume. And they get quite a good uh, level on the common European framework, but they're quite bad at customer support yeah? in, in English or whatever the target language is. So it doesn't always map across. So what's the target language of the curriculum? How do you know they've learned what they've learned? Uh, results not available to the end of the course, so it's kind of a black box. While the course is going on, too late to change when it's gone too far. Uh, this shift of employees to remote or hybrid situations is difficult to manage for trainer, training managers. Still a lot of training, and this is a, a digital or virtual, you know, a, an event focused on the digital and virtual world. But if you look at studies of the language training in, in corporate space worldwide, most of it is still happening uh, on-site traditionally. It's shifting, but a lot of it is actually still traditional on-site. It sort of paused during the pandemic, but people have gone back to that model to some degree. Inefficiency, long duration of courses, training based on anecdotal needs without data support. This is a killer for the CFO, for procurement. They don't like anecdotal. Yeah? Uh, Non-scalable solutions. People now, if I read the tenders that are coming across my desk, I see it's, it's really big. It's, it's multiple countries. They want one provider, one signature, one service provider. I'm tired of dealing with 300 providers. It ties up their HR people. They don't have that much budget. They want to use them for other, pe uh, other things, right? Uh, new skills not transferring to the point of work, and that's that Kirkpatrick model again. And it's difficult to measure progress. And so just a, a couple of potential solutions, half solutions, directions of thought, right? Outcome-driven curricula, so skills frameworks. And you see that becoming more and more popular. I think you've all probably come across that in the past. Transparent 24-7 reporting, flexibility in time and place. That's the delivery channel. So that's uh, digital blended solutions. Actually, the speaker before me made, a, I think, a very good point. He was talking about uh, skills development, and I think he was talking about soft skills and even hard technical skills. He was saying that pure digital uh, delivery doesn't really move the dial, right? You need human involvement, and I can only support that. But I can also say that blended solutions bring together the scalability and, and, and price attractiveness with that human element. So I, I think that's going to be a real growth area and solve some of these problems. Um, yeah, short courses. I think taking over the publishing for yourself, that's something we did at LearnShip, um, because Traditional publishers move differently. They have different targets, different business models. Making our own content made us a bit more flexible. Right? Yeah, scalable solutions, skills that transfer well to the working environment. And that means when you do the publishing yourself, consulting industry-specific 
content. So McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, you know, Deloitte, they're always surveying uh, the industry fields and reading their reports for the next 10 years will give you an indication of where everything is moving and then working that into the content. So clearly defined and time box learning outcomes, matching the methodology and the delivery channel to the, uh, uh, and to the budget. But also as you have more people working uh, digitally now, they're working in a computer mediated environment and linguistically or in, in, in the study of communication, it's different to speaking face to face. So it makes sense to have uh, your training delivered, computer mediated, to prepare people for their jobs, which are becoming increasingly computer mediated, right? So there's a pedagogical reason to do this as well as an economic reason. Yeah, quality without compromising return on expectations. And then measurable ROI, basically, because they could put money into training or they could buy tables and chairs or they could upgrade the computers or they could buy some trucks, right? There's lots of things companies can do with money. Um, we just need to show them what we're doing with it. Okay, and this leads me to some um, data, right? I like data, I think we all do. Um, these are some dashboards we put together um, as part of our new blended learning solution, which is called Sprint. By the way, our booth is just next door here. It's LearnShip. You can please talk to any of our, um, our sales team. They're, they're here to talk to you in more detail about it. I just want to talk about the reports here quickly. So basically, pulling uh, information on two axes. One is engagement. The other one is performance. Engagement being, do people show up for classes? Do they do the exercises? And performance, how well do they do on the exercises? How well do they do in class? So combining a human uh, subjective judgment on continuous assessment model based on a, a scoring rubric for the skill, and then uh, having the can-do statements allocating points uh, to the same report, you can plot this on a graph. You get quite a lot of interesting data. Uh, the cluster analysis is one of my favorites. So you, you have engagement as one axis and performance as another axis. Each learner appears as a dot, right? You hover your mouse, you can see all the, the information about that specific learner, but you see how they cluster in cohorts. You can see if they're trying really hard, but they're not succeeding, or they're not trying at all, and they're not succeeding, which is not surprising. But you can see if the material is statistically too, too difficult, too easy, how things are moving. You can animate that over time. Um, and it just helps uh, the content development teams to make sure they're pitching at the right level. Uh, and basically, the, the, the product teams uh, to see where they need to improve. And these are things that we have these days that we didn't have in the past, and we need to be using them. Because this is data that data people like when they make procurement decisions. I moved this cohort from here to here. You know That happened. And I can show you the methodology and we can talk it through. Probably not perfect, but it holds some water and I can explain it to you logically. And that's a conversation that's important to have in a structured way. Right? And this is just you know, a little bit of feedback. This is um, one of our uh, learning and development um, specialists, which is Bayer from uh, IBM Intesa. Really liked Sprint. Uh, we only launched it a couple of years ago. It's taking off quite well. We increased the range of uh, skill areas uh, this year. And we also expanded to French, German, and Spanish. We did English first. And, and this is a, an area of B2B corporate training I believe in personally. Yeah? And this is Anna Valerella um, from Unicredit and uh, IBM. So yeah, I, I think one of the, the reasons this works very well is if you've got structured digital preparation, this flipped classroom model works pretty well because people are arriving with some sense of what's expected of them. They have some target language already kind of, uh, and they've got their own questions from what they've experienced and the live sessions hit a bit uh, sweeter. Yeah. So basically this is what we've done so far. Um, one area is the skills practice and what we're trying to do there is to simulate what people do on the job. So what we do is we come up with uh, fictitious companies with real problems. Those problems are extracted from Forbes, from uh, business publications, um, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and so on. Uh, and then we simplify those case studies for people learning a language. We language grade them, basically. And then we pre-teach target language, we go through these kind of uh, case studies, and then we, then we play. Then we do a kind of task-based environment when we speak, and then afterwards we give feedback in two different areas. One is language accuracy, and the other one is task completion, because they're not the same. Yeah? 
And uh, this year we added the specific purpose content. So human resources, customer care, logistics, finance, technology, fast moving consumer goods, sales, healthcare and pharma. These are the industry verticals we think are, are growing or uh, embracing digital training the most energetically. Uh, but we will add to the catalog. It's going quite well. What, what I will say is that the, in, the engagement rate and the recommendation rate are far higher when there's a human involved, right? It, it's, it's almost one-to-one -one the way that works. Uh, people love their teachers. And there's a space where people can rate each lesson out of five. And, and there's also like a free text box. And I must say, most of the, most of the commentary is about the teacher, yeah? But it's, it's structuring it in a way, right, that it makes sense operationally, that it makes sense commercially. And the pedagogy is untouched. This fragile thing is protected because you've got the housing right. Yeah? And I think that's the core of this. So basically, I'm, I'm coming to the end of the presentation itself. I hope we have a few minutes for, for questions. But it's basically this. Right? Imagine a world in which everyone contributes to the success of the organization. So we're able to identify skills gaps. We're able to close skill gaps. Right? And we're able to speak the language of measuring the contribution. So it's not some logical leap. It's not somebody feeling awkward and uncomfortable because they're trying to translate their real feelings into numbers for people who only listen to numbers. And the numbers people are getting frustrated and they're leaving the room. We don't want that. Uh, so it's building the product in such a way that everybody understands what we're trying to achieve. And I think that's not easy, but I think it's the route to success in what we're trying to do as a, a group of people, essentially, in uh, corporate L&D. Yeah? So um, at that point, I think if there are questions, I'm here and I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we do have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I'll bring the microphone over to you. There's a microphone coming to you, could you please let us know of your top topics, business topics requested by your French um, customers today as... Uh, the business you know, topics requested by French customers? Yeah, most, various, various industries. Yes, various, industries. various industries, so logistics, uh, manufacturing, uh, right. fast-moving consumer goods. What about the business topics uh, most sorry. requested, the top five? Most requested topics. These are the ones LD. that Thank we've you. been discussing here at the event today, I can tell you. So fast-moving consumer goods, manufacturing, technology, and finance, I would say. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry, I came a little bit late, but I understand that your, the, the age that you have, it's... Uh, and what makes your solution very good, it's to have identify where you want to go, where you are, and to, in an objective way, uh, uh, show the progress, right? This yes, is, this exactly. Is, okay. And how did you do that? Like, uh, concretely? Um, it starts normally with a statement of a business problem. Okay. So you would have what's called a consultative sales call. And you would say, look, what seems to be the matter? Yeah? Yeah. And, and, and that could be all sorts of things. People have problems in the supply chain. Yeah. So you have companies which have a head office in, in Kentucky, yeah. you know, but their supply chain reaches into Southeast Asia. Right? And, and things are changing hands multiple times. And, and if they're changing hands multiple times, there's a decay of the message of the communication. Yeah. And it's expensive. Yes. And so being able to translate that into dollars and cents is the beginning of the business statement, because then you're framing it like that. Yeah? And then you say, OK, can I interview some people? Can I talk to them? And you get a bit of color. You know, I'm just talking from the creative side. And then you will know either we have something in the catalog or we make something. But typically, they, they, I showed you on the screen. That's meetings, presentations. It, the same stuff comes up over and over again. And then the industry vertical. And, and, and somewhere between that consultative process and then having the off-the-rack solution with a license base, with reporting, with standard SLAs, you're ready to go. But it's really understanding what the problem is is the first step. Okay, yeah. clear. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. 
Um, in in one of the graphs, you showed um, the comparison, like the the different points in the graph, and you are showing uh, the correlation between performance and engagement. Yes. How how do you measure performance? Yeah, and, this... and and more importantly, how do you make sure that the performance that you measure is related to the trainings that happened? That's a very good question. Now, firstly, I want to clarify the terminology. The performance I'm talking about is the academic performance on the course. So the, that's a different thing to the uh, transfer of the skills to the point of work, which is done through surveys, right? So you could do that through peers. You can do that through the line manager. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. That's not what I was showing on the graph because I don't have that data unless I'm surveying necessarily. And those surveys need to be very good. I mean, then you would need proper... Um, statistic analysis, if you're doing that at scale, to trust data coming in like that. But you could add it to the model. It's not in there now. Yeah? Okay. So uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's clear to have the, the information. The, you also mentioned the, the return on investment as one of the things that you need to define when you're defining your trainings. This one is a tricky one, right? Because, uh, yes. And uh, yeah, in, on, on that, do you have like... Uh, a philosophy or some, some things that you could share with us on how you do to build that? Yes, and what I would say is I think there are a lot of people in the world of sales who would claim to have a foolproof mechanism for showing return on investment of any one intervention, whether it's training or anything else. I think personally I'm uncomfortable with uh, silver bullets, yeah? but, but I would say this. One very strong way of doing it is, is a self-reported statement. So how much is this problem costing you? How much do you think it's related to, to language problems and so on? Um, uh, another way is then evaluating the cost of the training and comparing the two. Yeah? I think that's quite strong because it's self-reported. I think any mechanism you show is going to be open to kind of subjectivity kind of criticism. Right? And the other thing you mentioned before is multi-causal nature phenomenon. Right? So training might be one cause, but there's other stuff happening. So if I'm teaching you Spanish and I'm teaching somebody else Spanish, um, maybe one person has Spanish friends, right? And the other one doesn't. And I say, yeah, they did the digital course and they learned Spanish. It, it may well be something else that, that that was the cause. So I think you need to be a little bit careful because ultimately in, in corporate life, this is my experience, credibility and relationships are everything. So I, I prefer to just come up with the best mechanism I can, explain it very clearly, and say that's how I'm doing it. And then, you know, you work together in a kind of dialogue. I think that's the best, yeah. Hi, Michael Osborne from Upscale, um, Upscale Digital here. Uh, my question is, um, you, you showed a slide earlier about um, talking about learning outcomes to you know, and uh, C-suite speak. Um, how are you upskilling your team to be able to do that? So for example, I'm a manager with a lot of um, L&D people. They, they're great on, um, oh, they increase the NPS and the learner score. How are you upskilling your team in that position to, to talk C-suite? I would invite your CFO to talk to your people and say, what does he care about? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And, and more than that, I would say, how do you uh, ask the CFO or procurement, how do you guys think? How do you make your decisions? Take me through it and just let them talk and make notes. Yeah, no, that's great. That's what Thank I would do. <laughs> okay, time for maybe one more if we have. Anybody else with any questions before we wrap up for the session? One more. All right. Back for, for a follow-up. No, a different, different topic. So what, what you are saying is that in the beginning of your, I would say, projects, you are talking to your customers, and then you are taking a decision to build a custom-made custom, a custom -made training, or you go with your standard... Uh... Yeah, look, I mean, if you have something in the catalog, it's better, right? It's available quicker. Um, obviously, it's no cost to us to develop or to the client to, to fund. But I mean, sometimes there's a business case for a custom build. So I think you've got to evaluate, right? And then it's build or buy. You, there's like a decision tree. But I think in the beginning, you must understand the problem and then check if you've got something in the catalog to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Anything else before we wrap up the session? Well, then, thanks once again. So thanks, Robert. That was terrific. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And to all our speakers.